Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. And this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. Braving winter storms. That's what we're Damn doing. Right. Yep. It's terrible. <laughs> we're it's recording worst. on Friday. My kids are out of school. Yeah. Canceled you school. Weather. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We've got the ice. And the Carolinas don't do the ice. No, no. Just just a um anticipation of ice cancels. Oh, right. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Although we did actually get it. So <laughs> Right. Yeah. But I know that there's definitely been times where it's like they call it out and it's like, no, well, it didn't happen or it didn't happen as bad or, what you know, and like right. we could totally been in school. <laughs> it's supposed to snow later today. So we'll see. But I'm staying in my PJs all day. I don't blame you. Maybe I'll I kind of want to do that. I would if I was like going to be like homebound. Essentially, I'd be like, I'm not moving. <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you. So my kids have been on the phone with their friends this today, mm-hmm. you know, because they're out of school, and so they've been talking on the whatever that Facebook thing is for kids, you know. Oh, Messenger, yeah, mm-hmm. Messenger kids, yeah. Have you ever paid attention to your kids when they're on the phone with their friends, little kids? Do you I ever mean, like I, listening? Yeah. I am so impressed with the way that they get off the phone. Oh, really? Yeah. They're just like, all right, I'm going to go now. Bye. Click. (laughs) (laughs) That's so true. They just get off. It's extremely impressive to me because as an adult, do you not feel like getting off the phone is one of the most tedious things on the planet? I feel like that. Even like with my yeah. mom, I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go. And she's like, okay. And then you're like, all right, love you. Okay, I'll call you tomorrow. Okay, that sounds good. I'll talk to you then. It takes a full 30 plus seconds to get off the phone when really we should just be like, all right, I'm going to go. Okay, bye. Click. <laughs> How or much time? Not even like the back and forth of like, okay, I'll go. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Like there's like, okay, I'm going to go. And then you say it like 15 times, but then another story <laughs> pops up Sometimes. and all of a sudden it's like 20 minutes later and you're like, okay, now I really got to go now. <laughs> Sometimes it happens. So I mean, yeah. I'm listening to my kid or like I, w- I went into my one kid and was like, Hey, I need to talk to you about something really quick. And she goes, Hey, my mom needs to talk to me. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Can we all take a tip from the way that our kids hang up the phone? <laughs> no, for real. I'm here for it. Who's with me? Yeah, no kidding. I guess I should stop like not I don't give them crap for it, but sometimes I'm like, dude, did you even let them say bye? No, like, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> they are like, no. I told them I had to go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, dudes. I'm so here for that. I'm going to start doing that to you now. Like when we're done today, I'm going to be like, <laughs> click, got to go by click. <laughs> no more pleasantries. No, no, Count no, me done. out. Done. <laughs> okay. um, I will um, piggyback on that real quick to talk about, um, have you ever, well, you don't have a teen, well, you have a preteen, but anyway, my teen, how he answers the phone mm-hmm. or, or lack thereof. Like basically he like, he hits like answer and then just puts it to his ear. <laughs> okay. And so they're supposed to know because it quits ringing. Right. right? <laughs> so I've called him, I don't know how many times and I'm like, hello, <laughs> are, are you there? Hello? And he'll, and like, it's like a full 15 seconds. And he'll be like, yeah, what's up? And I'm like, how, do, how? <laughs> you're supposed to answer like, Push the button. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> They've seen us do it so many times. Where are we failing them? <laughs> We're not teaching them phone pleasantries. No, apparently not. Well, I mean, they don't talk that much on the phone anyway. That's but true. <laughs> I don't anymore either. I don't know. I just, I, I just text everyone. I know. Me too. I know. Uh, we're definitely in that like older generation where people call us and we're like, what? Who died? What do you need? What happened? Yeah, exactly. Oh Are my you? gosh. Somebody yeah. calling me. <laughs> why, why is she calling me? <laughs> do you say that? <laughs> like, I say that to my husband. We'll be sitting and I'll be like, oh my God, why is she? It's Christy. Why is she calling me? What happened? Hello? You okay? <laughs> it's usually my dad when he calls me and I'm like, what? Oh my God, something happened. Yeah. <laughs> my, <laughs> my mom does talk- call me. <laughs> Well, I'll, I I don't even talk on the phone that much with my mom t- too much these days. I mean, I need to get better about that. But she's the one that I would talk to on the phone. So if my dad's cell phone calls me, I'm like, oh, yeah. 
It's getting real. It <laughs> All right. Down to some crime. One thing that we want to mention before we get into this episode is that the audio on Christie's end is a little lacking this go round. Yeah. We had some technical difficulties with what was it like a plug issue or something? Yeah, the, the port I was plugging in like basically crapped out. And so it sounds like I'm on a phone. phone. Oh, yeah, it does. So, but Distance. I'm on the mic, so it's not going to affect you hearing the story. But we just wanted you guys to be aware that we were aware. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. You can tell us if you want, though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call us. We won't answer. Nope. <laughs> All right. Or I'll just sit on the other end like this. Yeah, <laughs> for 15 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> what do you want? All right, anyway. here comes your crime. Okay, bye. All right, here we are with your crime for this Monday. This one. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is a listener's suggestion from Brenda. Hey, Brenda. Thanks for the suggestion. And I think you're going to know it. Maybe not when I say the name, but when I get into it, you're, I'm going to see that light bulb, I feel like. Okay. Ding on in your head. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no pressure. This is the story of the McStay family. Okay. So Joseph Brian McStay was born November 20th, 1969 in Akron, Ohio. He had one brother and his parents divorced when he was young and his dad moved to Texas and his mom moved herself and the two boys to California. So he was really young when he went to California and he just completely becomes like a California dude. That's how he feels, like, in my opinion. That's how he is. He's very laid back. He loves to surf, loves the beach. He has long, wavy hair and just really nice, typical California guy, like I said. So he got married young and had a son, but that marriage didn't work out. So they separated, and he ran a beach gift shop. That's how it's described, but it looks to me like one of those touristy shops that are on like the boardwalk. Oh, you know, like okay. if you're walking down a boardwalk and you want to go like buy a shirt that says, you know, Outer Banks or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like one of those right. shops that sells those things. But in the early 2000s, he started his own business called Earth Inspired Products. And this business built water fountains. Indoor water fountains, the types of water fountains that you see hanging on the wall in like big hotels or businesses or restaurants. Do you know what I'm talking about? They're everywhere. Yeah, I do. But okay, I didn't, I don't know. I don't know where I thought they came from, but interesting that, yeah, is this like the biggest one out there company wise? Well, they were huge, definitely huge. I mean, Mm -hmm. immediately it exploded and became like a multi million dollar company. Very successful company. And he's even in like um, like Paul Mitchell Studios and um, like Hershey, the Hershey Chocolate Factory thing. They're like big name places bought his stuff. Right. Okay. okay. So in 2004, Joseph met a young lady by the name of Summer. Summer was actually born Virginia Lisa Aranda. So I'm not sure where we got Summer, but... Yeah, but that's, to me, also just a strange sounding name, Virginia Lisa. I don't know. It doesn't like flow for me. Right. Yes. So apparently it did not flow for summer either. And so she changed it. And she was born December 27th, 1966 in LA County, California. So Summer had also been married before and that marriage did not work out, but no children. And she's described as loving and passionate She grew up in California, so she also was very, loved the beach, loved to surf, very outdoorsy. She had long, really long, dark hair. So they're very similar, these two people. And they meet and they fall in love. And um, Summer was a real estate agent at the time. So after only dating for several months, they learned that Summer was pregnant. And in July of 2005, the couple had a son that they named Gianni. 
And then in January of 2007, they had a second son that they named Joseph Jr. Okay. So they have two boys very close together. Um, They're very happy. And then in November of 2007, so this is like the same year that their second son was born, they got married. Okay. So they were not married when they had their kids. They got married later on after the second Mm -hmm. one. So Joseph's business is doing really well. Summer is taking care of the boys. I think she was a stay-at-home mom after the second one was born, but I don't know. It's not clear. I know she was a real estate agent. I don't know if she picked her own hours, worked part-time, or if she was just stay-at-home. Sources are different, but either way, she was like the person who took care of them the most while Joseph ran this business. Joseph had a YouTube channel, and he would post like all kinds of videos of the family at the beach learning to surf, riding bikes, birthday parties, really, really cute. And they had um, two dogs named Bear and Digger that they loved that are in the videos a lot. Did and you the watch boys, any of them? I did. I watched several of them, actually. They're still up and they're so cute. And the boys had um, like the long surfer hair too, like mm-hmm. their dad. Cute. It was really cute. They seem really happy. Oh, so oh. well, I'm, not, I'm sad that this is a story we're telling. <laughs> I know. Yeah. In November 2009, the couple bought a house in Fallbrook, California. So Fallbrook is a town just north of San Diego. Mm. It was a five bedroom house, beautiful area. And they plan to do some upgrades and like work on it and then sell it and make a profit. And then they were going to move to the beach or closer to the beach. That's, that was their dream. So it really seems like they are just doing the dang thing. Like they're living their best life. I don't know if it seems like that. I think they actually were. Right. Yeah. yeah sounds like really it. happy, really sweet family, super successful. Just everything was working out. Done, done, done. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so that brings us uh, to February of 2010. The McStays had been in their new home for four months and were doing renovations on it, painting it, new countertops, bathroom upgrades. Joseph was 40, Summer was 43, Gianni was four, and Joseph Jr. was three. So the family wakes up on February 4th, 2010 and started a normal day. Summer spoke to her sister that morning. Her sister had just had a baby. And so she had planned, like made plans with her to go visit her the next week so that she could meet the new baby. So at some point during the day, we know that Summer and the boys went to a Ross department store and picked up like some things for the house, like a jacket for one of the boys, just, you know, whatever. And then they hung out at home. It was just a normal day for them. Joseph had spoken with his dad that morning. Everything was totally fine. He said he had a lunch meeting with a guy who worked for him named Charles Merritt, who goes by Chase. So Chase was a welder. So he worked for Joseph and would help him make these custom water fountains. Oh, all right. Yeah. And the two had become good friends, best friends, some people would say. But as of late, Joseph had been having issues with, like, the quality of Chase's work. So, like, things would be wrong with it, and customers would call, and he would say, yeah, yeah, I'll fix it, I'll repair it, but then, you know, kind of slow doing that. And Chase had also was having some issues financially because he had, like, a gambling problem. And so Joseph would sometimes, like, front his paychecks for him to, like, bail him out. So, like, they would get an order for this custom fountain, Chase would be paid, let's say, $800 once it was completed. Well, Joseph would say, well, I'll give you 500 of the 800 just to help you out. Okay. But it had continued, you know, to happen. And so he had been loaning him money several times. Mm-hmm. So when Joseph told his dad, I'm having lunch with Chase, his dad was kind of like, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> So Joseph left the house and drove to a Chick-fil-A near where Chase lived, and the two of them had lunch, which was pretty uneventful. They discussed business. They discussed financial issues, future plans. Chase said that Joseph had given him some checks that he had owed him. Not Mm -hmm. sure what for, but we assume work. And then Joseph left. He went home. He stopped at the bank and deposited a check for the business. He made phone calls. He talked to Summer. 
He ran a few errands. I think Summer had asked him like, hey, on your way home, you stop at the store, pick you know, this up for me. So there were some calls and texts back and forth between them about that. And then he went home. Okay. Jo- Joseph called Chase again that night around 830, but Chase was with somebody. He was watching a movie. So he like, let it go to voicemail. I'll call him back tomorrow. So he calls him back the following day, but he never reaches him. He can't get a hold of him. So then Joseph's dad tries to call him. Can't get a hold of him. It's kind of going straight to voicemail. Not sure mm-hmm. what's going on, but nobody can really get a hold of him. So as the hours go on, the family is continuing to try to reach them. They can't get a hold of Summer. They can't get a hold of Joseph. So a few days go by and they still can't get a hold of him. So they're getting worried. So the family is like, well, okay, so apparently the mixed days, like I said, they're very free spirits. So it's not mm-hmm. totally unlike them to decide last minute to like go on an adventure go camping on the beach or whatever. So they're thinking, well, maybe that's what happened. Would they tell people they were doing that though? I mean, it's unclear. Mm -hmm. They're not super alarmed. So probably I think they would sometimes just kind of go off the grid for a couple of days and it wasn't crazy unlike them. So, but the family is like, well, let's verify this. Let's see if we can figure out where they are. So some of the family members go over to the house to try to find them. The house is locked up. They're not there. Everything is okay. Joseph's truck is in the driveway. It's locked. It looks super, super normal. And their two dogs are in the backyard. So they go to the backyard. The dogs have food and water. So someone is taking care of them, it seems like. So the family is like, well, maybe they are on a trip. You know, somebody, Mm -hmm. they've clearly arranged for somebody to take care of their dogs and feed and water their dogs. So okay, whatever. So they know that Summer had planned to go visit her sister. So they get in contact with her sister. Maybe she just went earlier than she had planned. But the sister is like, nope, I haven't heard from her. Mm. She wasn't supposed to come here. She's not here. I I can't get a hold of her either. So as the days go on and they start contacting more and more people, they realize that there's more and more people that have not heard anything from them in days and days. So the family is like, okay, we're concerned now. It's not like Mm -hmm. Joseph and Summer to go completely MIA for such a long period of time. And at this point, Joseph had work obligations that he was missing. Right. Like his company, the people that work for him are like, uh, what the heck? He missed this meeting or he's supposed to be here to help us with this. So it's odd at this point. Yeah. So on February 13th, Joseph's brother goes back over to the McStay's house and he's like, I'm going in. So he finds an unlocked window and he goes in the house. The house is messy, but it's not messy, odd messy. It's messy like there's two young boys that live here and we've just moved in and we're doing remodeling. That kind of messy. But so nothing super out of the ordinary, but it does seem like they had left in a hurry because there's like eggs on the counter that wouldn't typically have been left out. There are bowls of popcorn, like full bowls of popcorn sitting on the couch. That seems like somebody had just made them, sat down on the couch, and then ended up getting up and leaving. So that was kind of weird. And they also find that, like, there's a lot of personal belongings there, like clothes and shoes and coats and medicine. And um, their suitcases were there. Um, Stuff that they would have taken if they had gone on a trip. Right. Exactly. So a little weird in that regard. And their their other car is gone. So they have an Isuzu Trooper. And it was it was supposed to be in the garage, and it was not in the garage. So that's gone. So some somebody left in the car. Right. So then they discover that no one actually was asked to feed their dogs. A neighbor had called because the dogs had been left out for an extended period of time, and animal control had been coming over and giving the dogs food and water t- until they could find like a temporary placement for them. So they were safe in the backyard. So animal control gets called by someone. I don't know who. And so so now. Why? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt you. Why would animal control not report that to you? Like to someone that they are having to go to this house to feed this these dogs that are not being taken care of. So why wouldn't they question. report it to like the police? You know, like, we don't know why they're not, nobody's answering ever when we knock and we have to go and take care of these for days. 
I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's weird. The whole yeah. thing is weird. Everything that happens in this case is so weird. Okay. Okay. So now the family is like, okay, something's up. Mm -hmm. They would never leave their dogs like this. This is weird. So Michael, Joseph's brother, calls and reports the family missing. And he says, nobody has seen them since February 4th. That's the last time we know anyone's talked to them. That's the last time we can confirm that anybody has had contact with them. And by this time, it had been 11 days. It was February 15th. So 11 days had passed, almost two weeks. So a long time. Mm -hmm. So the police search the McStay's home and they find the same thing that Michael finds. There's no signs of a struggle. There's no evidence of foul play. There's no forced entry. Nothing is missing. So there was no robbery. So they put on a put out a be on the lookout for their car, that Isuzo Trooper. Mm -hmm. When they put that out, they get a hit and find out that the car had actually been towed on February 8th four days after the family was last seen. The car had been abandoned in a parking lot near the Mexican border, about 70 miles south of their home. Oh, wow. The car was brought in. It was in normal condition, no signs of a struggle, no blood in the car, no foul play, nothing. It was perfectly normal. So police are like, well, what were they doing at the Mexican border? Right. So they then get some surveillance from a neighbor's security camera that shows the car, this exact car, this Isuzu Trooper, leaving the McStay's driveway the night of February 4th. But it only shows the back end of the car because it's a neighbor's surveillance camera. So it just shows the back. So it doesn't show who's in the car or who was driving the car or, you know, the passengers of the car. It just shows that it was in the driveway Then the lights come on and then the car pulls out. Mm. So police also search their computers, their personal computers, and they find some searches on Summer's computer for like inquiries about passports, what is required to take children to Mexico. And she had also ordered like Spanish speaking software, like that Rosetta Stone type Mm -hmm. thing, you know, to teach them how to all speak Spanish. So police are like... They went to Mexico. The McStays are in Mexico. Like, they're clearly doing searches on their computer for this. They up and left. They're gone. And their car was found at the border. Why did they leave their car, though? Well, exactly. It's very weird. So none of them actually did ever get passports, by the way. So they they did inquiries of, like, what would be required, like, the requirements to get a passport, how long it takes, things like that. But they didn't – none of them had them. So – you can still cross the Mexican border without a passport. Right. You just can't get back. You can't get back to the U.S. unless you have one. So so police are like, okay, if they are in Mexico, they walked because their car was abandoned in a parking lot. So they've walked right. to Mexico. So they start looking at surveillance of like the pedestrian border where you can actually walk into Mexico. And they find this surveillance video. It's like a really grainy video of who they believe is the McStay family. This is on February 8th. So this is the same day that the car was towed. And it's of two adults and two children. And they're just like casually walking over the border. It's, like I said, really grainy. It's just their backs. So you can't really tell that it's them for sure. Right. So I watched it. I watched the video several times, actually. Mm -hmm. And... It could be them. I mean, it they're the same size. The kids mm-hmm. seem to be a similar age. But honestly, you there's no way to tell, in my opinion, because it's just their backs. It's just a man. It's a woman. It's two kids. You can't tell hair color. It's nighttime. You can't tell even if the kids are boys or girls. Mm-hmm. Like you really, in my opinion, yes, it could be them. But I don't know. There's nothing identifying about it that says to me that it's them other than meets their description. Yeah. You can't say 100% certainty it's them. And so we know that they went to Mexico. Like, right. Exactly. And what I can tell you is in that video that the, those four people that are walking over the border, they have nothing with them, not a backpack, 
not any luggage. Even the kids, they're not carrying a stuffy, like a blanket, Mm -hmm. nothing. They literally are just like skipping over the border. One's holding hands with the mom. One's holding hands with the dad. That's it. They have nothing. Coats. They have Mm -hmm. coats on. Okay. So also, there's no evidence that they had any financial trouble. And they actually left $100,000 in their bank account that was completely untouched. Hmm. So they didn't take any money with them. They weren't having financial trouble. The business was fine. There is some evidence in like emails and things like that, that the couple had been planning on starting like a marriage counseling program. Hmm. But that's normal. I mean, in my opinion. Yeah. But the police really think, based on all of this like evidence, this path that they're led down, linking the McStays to Mexico, that they just up and left. Mm-hmm. They just they just right. went to Cabo or wherever, you know. <laughs> um, the family and friends totally disagree with this, but they don't have an explanation either. There's no yeah. sign of them. They just vanished, and we do have these computer searches, and we do have their car, and so they have no clue what's going on. So over the next few months and years, there were like tips and sightings of them in various places, Mexico included, and the family followed up, the police followed up, but none of them turned out to be them. It was like they literally just vanished. So, So, yeah, so a lot of theories were thrown around about what may have happened to them or why they may have fled. And it was like, oh, they're they have ties to the mob. There's, you know, bad business. And some people blamed Summer. Some people said that she was poisoning Joseph prior to their disappearance because he apparently had been suffering from an undiagnosed medical issue at that time. And so people were like, well, maybe she was poisoning them. And then she disappeared them all. And, you know, just conspiracy theories (laughs) or whatever. I don't know. They were crazy, (laughs) crazy things. Like, Right, yeah. Okay. But none of these theories, not the conspiracy ones, not the family's theories, or the police's theory that they fled to Mexico are going to prove to be true. Mm. And I will tell you why right after this break. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, come on. I want to know when, what the heck happened. <laughs> I don't know I this know. case. I will tell you, I do not know it. <laughs> it's wild. It's huge. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So on November 13th of 2013. Okay. Holy crap. They disappeared in 2010. So three years. Mm -hmm. Three and a half. A guy riding on a motorcycle trail near in the desert near Victorville, California, finds human remains. So again, this is three and a half years since the McStays had last been seen. And this was about 100 miles from their Fallbrook home, literally in the desert. Okay. Yeah, it was 100 miles. The human remains were in two shallow graves. One grave contained a male and a young child. The other one was a smaller adult, so seemingly a female, and another young child. Not all of the bones were there. Some of them had been scattered, moved by animals, but they were able to do dental records and identify the two adults as being Joseph and Summer McStay, and the two children were assumed to be Gianni and Joseph Jr. Oh, my goodness. Okay, all four of them had severe head trauma. Severe. Yeah, I'm not going to go into details, but they had all been struck multiple times in the head. There were fractures. There was evidence of brutal beatings Mm -hmm. on all of these, these people. The cause of death for all of them was listed as blunt force trauma to the head, and also found buried in one of the graves was a three-pound sledgehammer. The sledgehammer contained DNA of a couple of the McStay family members. So that is believed to have been the murder weapon. Jeez. There was also paint spots on the sledgehammer that matched paint from the McStay's home. So it was their sledgehammer. So it was their sledgehammer, they believe. Oh. Also, with the bodies, they found like linens and towels and things like that that were like wrapped around Joseph, and they also matched or were similar to other towels and linens that had been found in the mixed days home. Hmm. 
So some they're connected to their house at some, you know, in some way. Right. The murder yeah. weapon is from there. Things that were used to clean up, theoretically, were from there. Okay, so, and it was very clear that they the remains had been there for years. Oh my so they believe that they had been killed back in February of 2010, and this is where they had been that whole time. Hmm. So they're not just missing people anymore. Now the police have a quadruple homicide investigation on their hands and their poor families so devastated because, you know, I mean, even though they thought, well, it's not like them to run away to Mexico, they still have that hope that they're alive mm-hmm. and living yeah. somewhere. And now they've confirmed that not only Joseph and Summer are gone and had been brutally murdered, but these two baby boys mm-hmm. and everyone's just wondering like who, who would do this to him, to them right? and why? Yeah. Who and why? So the four mixed days were laid to rest in Orange County, California, and their shared headstone reads, riding the waves in heaven. Oh. So that's very sweet. Mm -hmm. So the investigation is on fire. Police are determined to bring their killer or killers to justice. And like with any murder investigation, they start with those closest to them. Mm -hmm. Family members, friends, business associates, they start looking really hard into Joseph's company and really start to dig into financials and paperwork, things like that. They re-interview everyone who had contact with the McStays on the last day of their lives. And it's really narrowed down to like Joseph's dad, Summer's sister, you know, a few family friends and Joseph's friend and employee, Chase Merritt. Mm. If you remember, Chase was the last person to see Joseph. That right, we know yeah. of before he disappeared when they had lunch at the Chick Fil A. Mm-hmm. Oh, right, right. So once the bodies were found, the police went back to the family's vehicle, which was still being stored in an evidence locker, like okay. a big, freaking big evidence That's, locker. Gosh, know. that yeah, and the fact that they still have it, right? I don't right, know, that's a long time. Yes, three and a half years later. Yeah. So they began thoroughly testing it. Now. I'm not going to shame these police, but why didn't they test it before? Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, they didn't suspect foul play. That's the only excuse. And they didn't see anything like um, super out of the ordinary in it initially. Right. right? Like, yeah. So. Right. So, in, and there still wasn't anything super out of the ordinary. They found right. all four family members' DNA, but they also found the DNA of a fifth person. Do you oh. want to guess who it was? Chase. Chase Merritt. Oh, Chase's man. DNA was found on the car's steering wheel, the gear shift, the air conditioning controls. Chase had driven that car. Right. So, Chase Merritt had felony convictions for burglary and receiving stolen property and had actually spent some time in prison. His most recent conviction was in 2001 for the theft of $32,000 worth of welding equipment. Oh, my word. (laughs) This has a known gambling problem and financial issues. And during the time that the McStays went missing, Chase owed Joseph upwards of $40,000. Oh, jeez. So police went back to the recording of Chase's initial interview with them after the McStays disappeared. Mm -hmm. And they noticed in in the interview that he continuously referred to Joseph in the past tense. He was my best friend. Those types of things. Mm -hmm. So they also remember Chase told them, yeah, we met at Chick-fil-A. We talked about the business. We had lunch. He's, he was my best buddy. Right. And he had given him some checks that he had owed him. Mm-hmm. So police start digging into those checks and they subpoena the QuickBooks. So there were 10 checks that were given to Chase that totaled about $15,000. Now, all of the checks were dated February 4th. But when they went into the QuickBook, QuickBooks records, they show that the checks were actually not created until February 9th and had been backdated to February oh. 4th. So who oh. did that? Because it wasn't Joseph. He right. Wasn't they were he gone. wasn't yeah, he wasn't anywhere near QuickBooks at that point. 
Right. They also found in the QuickBook records that they subpoena that a call had come in to QuickBook's customer service also on February 9th. The caller said that he was Joseph McStay and asked to cancel my QuickBooks account. Cancel it. Delete everything. Um, okay. Does now, QuickBooks actually do that? <laughs> well, yes, but the caller did not have the master password, so it was not able to be well, done. So that's how it. they were able to still get all of these records. Well, that makes so the, sense. Right. So the police traced this call back to the phone number of Chase Merritt. Oh my he God. Come on, made Chase. the call. Dude. Investigators also discover that Chase has connections to Victorville, California, where the bodies were found. The desert. Remember, mm. that's where the mixed day's remains were discovered. His family, apparently he grew up in the desert, and his family only lived about seven minutes from the exact spot where the mixed days were. The other connection that Chase has with that area is that coincidentally, on February 6th, just two days after the McStays went missing, his cell phone pinged in that exact area. Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Chase did not drink his V8 mm -hmm. and get right. his mind clear. So Chase is brought in. He denies everything. He denies driving their car. He denies being in the desert. He denies writing the checks, calling QuickBooks, denies it all. However, on February 4th of 2014, Charles Chase Merritt is arrested and charged with four counts of first-degree murder, and he pled not guilty. The trial was live-streamed to the public. Oh, whoa. whoa. Interesting. Yeah, you can watch it still. So the prosecution knows that the evidence that they have is mostly circumstantial, but the amount of damning circumstantial evidence is pretty freaking ridiculous, if you ask mm. me. So the prosecution theorizes that Chase was having serious financial issues, was very in debt to Joseph and the business, and that the meeting at the Chick-fil-A was possibly Joseph telling Chase, like, you're fired. You're fired. I'm right. done well, with you. Yeah. And you owe me money. You owe me all this money, and I'm coming for it. Right. Coming to collect. And mm -hmm. if you don't give it to me, I'm going to file charges against you. It's $40,000. Yeah, that's, so, that's not, it's not just like, you know, a couple thousand where, I mean, even that would be a lot, but <laughs> it's not, it's, that's a lot of money. Yeah. It's really tough to pay back $40,000. Yeah. Yeah. So the motive was financial. One big roadblock that the prosecution had was that they did not know where the family had been killed. Because we're talking about beating four people mm -hmm. with a sledgehammer. So this is brutal. This is messy. We're right, talking yeah, where about, is that mess? <laughs> where exactly where is that mess? There's no indication or evidence of it anywhere in the home. None. So had it been cleaned up? Like that's a pretty thorough clean job. Thorough clean job. And then staged to make it look like they had left in a hurry. Had they been taken somewhere and killed there? I mean, there's there was so much evidence lost because if you remember, first of all, it had been three and a half years. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it was almost two weeks before they were even reported missing. So anyone could ha have had access to their home, their computers. I mean, we know that Chase did have access to their home and computers because he wrote the QuickBooks checks. And, mm -hmm. you know, so there's no telling who was in and out, what was taken, what was moved. We just don't know. But did he'd make the searches about the Mexico. Like, was there he? dates on those searches? There was, yes, and it was very close to the. T I think it was before, though. Hmm. I think the searches were done. They weren't done after February fourth. I think they were done before. But like, he could have done that anyway. They were best buddies. Right. Yeah, he could have been at their house and searched him up real quick. So in June of 2019, despite all of the questions and holes that we do have in the story, Chase was found guilty on all four counts of the first degree murders of Joseph Summer, Gianni, and Joseph Jr. Mixday. And shortly thereafter, Chase was sentenced to death. Oh. Now this is California. Right. Mm -hmm. So he is currently being held in our favorite California prison, San Quentin. <laughs> <laughs> Is he with what's his name? <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they are. They're Scott and Scott Peterson there. And somebody else we did recently. Yeah, there's several. 
So he continues to this day to maintain his innocence and is com- appealing his conviction. So, because this was just 2019. So it's very interesting to go back and watch his interview that he did with CNN, which was done like six months after the family disappeared. So this is when everybody thought that they fled to Mexico Mm -hmm. and they were possibly still alive. And there's all these conspiracy theories going around. And he is like dressed like this weird cowboy. He has like a cowboy Mm -hmm. hat and one of those like little tie things that like has the metal th- it's weird it's just <laughs> odd and it's so disgusting also t- the way he acts like he acts all worried and torn up and you know about the family leaving and where could they go and who you know are they happy and it's just mm-hmm. gross so yeah. and the whole time knowing that like he brutally murdered right. this entire family and dumped them in the desert like have fun in san quentin mm-hmm So one thing that annoys me about this case, and this is a little conspiracy theory of me. I didn't read this anywhere. I just was thinking it the whole entire time is that I honestly question how Chase did this all by himself. How could he? It's a family of four. Right. So any, and the thing is, if you shoot a family of four, you can do that really quick. This Mm. was, they were beat. Right. Each person hit multiple times. That takes a minute. So yeah. could he have done that alone? Could he have killed all four of them alone, taken their bodies, put them in the car, dumped them in the desert, then taken their car to the border, the Mexican border, and left it? And then what? Called an Uber? Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, who gave you a ride? Who gave you, a, who picked you up from the desert? Mm-hmm. Or who, yeah. who picked you up from the border? Like, did he do that? by And then goes home cleans up their house extremely thoroughly and stages it to look like they left in a hurry. I feel like somebody had to help him, even if they unknowingly helped him. If he called somebody and said, hey, can you pick me up on the Mexican border tonight? Right. Yeah. And they picked him up and were like, why were you here? And he was like, I don't know, just gambling. Don't you think maybe somebody would have come forward though once he was arrested? Exactly. And they never did. Hmm. And he's not talking because he's saying he's innocent. So we're not like getting those answers from him. Exactly. He has no idea what happened to them. So one last thing that I want to talk about is I read a book on this case. The book Mm -hmm. is called No Goodbye, The Mysterious Disappearance of the McStay Family. It's written by a radio host who had interviewed some of the family members and friends of the McStays while they were uh, missing people. So before Mm -hmm. they knew that they had been murdered. So it's published really, truly, like during all this conspiracy theory, they fled to Mexico. Why'd they flee? Did Summer poison him? All this kind of crazy stuff. And it's just full of those. It's full of like these theories and these wild allegations against Summer. And honestly, it it, I really hated it. <laughs> like it just, I think because we know now what happened to them. And so now reading the book back, it's very like ridiculous. And there's so much victim blaming going on. And this, the, the author really disliked summer for some reason. And so it's just, it's not a good book. So mm. I did like, and it's irrelevant at this point because the whole entire right. book is about all these conspiracy theories are like, why did they go to Mexico? Why did they flee? Kind of thing. Are they alive? Are they not? What's the evidence one way or the other? And so it's, it's irrelevant because now we know what happened to them. And so the author has actually publicly said that he does not want the book to be sold. So I used it for information like dates, things mm-hmm. that could were factually proven, you know, their address, things like that. But other than that, it's not a good rep- representation of like this case as a whole because it just ends before we really know what happened to them. So I don't know if anybody wants this book, but I'm not, I don't, I don't want it. <laughs> I'm not going to send it to you because it's just not reflective of the case and how it ended up. But if you want it, I have it. So send me a message. I'm not going to do a giveaway, but like the first person who messages me can have the book. I'll mail it to you if, if you want it. Otherwise I'm going to chunk it. All right. Well. And that is the story of the McStay family murders. That, I'm shocked I don't know this for some reason. I am too. Like, I just feel like that was probably like on the news when they had this 
footage of them crossing the border or supposed footage. You know, I just feel like maybe I just wasn't paying attention back in Yeah. And there's like so many documentaries on it. And it's mm-hmm. interesting to watch the documentaries because some of them were done while they were missing. Right. And then some of them were done now in recent times after right. the conviction and everything. So, yeah, I don't know. What I do know is this Chase dude is nasty. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in seeing a picture. I want to see a picture of the... Um, he looks totally normal. Oh, yeah. I'll post a picture. <laughs> um, and I'm also surprised, which... That big, being how big it was, did you, did you, uh, there's other podcasts that have done this, I'm assuming. Uh, I didn't look that up, but I'm sure. Oh, because that, that, that would be my other way of like knowing oh, it. Is if, I did look it up actually. Did you and say I, your favorites did it? Yes. <laughs> one of my ones that they're no, no longer around, but they did do a really quick um, episode of it. Hmm. But yeah, so there are some, but I didn't look up. I didn't look them all up. So yeah, I don't yeah. know. Anyway, that's surprising but anyway crazy case and so, crazy i mean horrible that these children had to oh my gosh exactly go through this yes so little babies this guy didn't want to play. i mean if you're that upset like i don't know like just kill joseph like why do you have to kill the entire family it's ridiculous uh, it's I mean, so awful like and to kill anybody but uh I mean, just be like, I can't pay you back. Sorry. I mean, I don't know what Joseph would have done if he had said that. But anyway, I don't know. The whole thing is just crazy to me that you know, this entire family. And 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 that it took this long to figure it out because cool. there, there was no proof that they went to Mexico. Like, they should have done more. I mean, I'm sure they did what they thought was enough at the time. Yeah, I think they truly believe that that's where they were. Right. But the whole entire case was cracked by finding Chase's DNA in the car. That could have been done back in 2010. Like, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Because then they would have been like, wait, why do you drive the car? And then they would have automatically started looking into him right away. Well, yeah. And that's what I was wondering, too. I forgot about this part. Um, When you were talking about the QuickBooks stuff, like, I just figured that in the beginning when this guy goes missing that they would just look into the business and stuff with the business right away to like see well maybe there was something there that we didn't know that he had to flee to Mexico for or whatever and so you would have been looking at the books and this and they would have even had that and then started thinking oh well Chase called made this call so maybe we should look into him more right exactly now. there's like little they things that they could have done that would have cracked it sooner not that he would have talked then probably either and maybe they wouldn't have found them any sooner right you know since he's saying he didn't do it yeah no i don't think they would have right found their remains but i think they would have had a suspect at the very least and you know yeah sad the whole thing is really sad i'm not gonna go to mexico if i vanish i'm not in mexico right don't care where you find my car I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> and, uh, and really, can uh, anybody trust any of our searches on our computer? Of Like, even if we said that, because we could be researching something like for this. Like, it's not because right. I want to go and do that. <laughs> I mean, if you researched well, my search history, you'd be like, man, she's planning to kill someone. <laughs> I specifically searched. Can you get into Mexico without a passport? Yeah. So see. So. People are gonna. If you went missing I, I tomorrow. Didn't see them in Mexico, friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you went missing tomorrow, they'd see that and be like, "Ah, she must have gone to Mexico." <laughs> and they would have found a grainy video of somebody with brown hair yes. walking across the border. There she is, skipping across the border. <laughs> okay. Ah, <sighs> well, I will. Bananas. Yeah. Nor would I owe you forty thousand dollars. So. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I don't have that to give you anyway. So. <laughs> I think we're safe. <laughs> we're not quite making that on this podcast yet. So. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Anyway, well, thanks for telling that story. And thank you, Brenda, for bringing that. Right, Brenda? Yeah, Brenda. Thanks, girl. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thanks for suggesting it. It was awesome. Good story. Good story. Okay. You're well, welcome. find us on the social medias. To get some pictures of yeah, Chase I'm gonna and- put the grainy video up or a picture of the oh. like a still of it because I have one. So okay. you guys will have to let me know. Okay, yeah, 
I mean, it obviously uh, wasn't them. But. Well, yeah, clearly. Who was mm-hmm. it? Oh, no. No, they need some that. random family. Another thing, too, they asked for that family to come forward. Like, if you rocked across the border and this is you, please come forward so that we can confirm that it was not oh. the McStays. And nobody ever came forward. Well, but were they publicizing that in Mexico? I don't know. <laughs> because I'm, if there's I guess. people are in Mexico still then, and, and they didn't even see it. Then they wouldn't right. come forward, right? Right. I mean, I don't yeah. know. Like, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <sighs> Anyways, well, Chase again, knows. I look forward. Chase knows everything, and one day he's going to crack. You think? I hope so. I want answers. I want to know. Yeah. How you did this, and who helped you? If yes. you got help, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm still looking forward to seeing all your social media posts for this too, because I'm curious about these. Okay. Isn't it interesting that I don't, um, and I don't do this. Like after we record, I don't like go and look up the case to see the pictures. <laughs> you wait <laughs> until I post them. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, and I don't know that that's like purposeful. It's just like, we finished recording, I go and do whatever. And then I forget that right. I want that it would be curious for me. And then I'm like, well, whatever. <laughs> like I'll see him in a couple weeks. <laughs> with yep. Drops. <laughs> so, so I look see him with everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> Just like I hear the story for the first time with everyone else. Exactly. (laughs) Keep it real. Keep it real. Anyways. Well, thank you for telling that story. I totally appreciate it. I love love spending this time with you. Yes. In the closet. (laughs) Even though it's a special time for us, it's horrible stories and there's just horrible people out there. And that's why you just always remember the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closets.